So record. Consistency. Is key. So we are Nicholas Ostheimer and Carter McDonald. We don't have an introduction slide here, so I'm just going to tell a little bit about myself and then uh, Carter can introduce himself. Um, I'm Nick Ostheimer. I'm a rising junior from FAU High School. I've done congressional debate for a while. Um, some of my accomplishments include being the season's TOC bid leader, champing Blue Key, champing UK season opener, champing Nova Titan. And finally, as tournaments like Stanford, TOC, and Digital Speech and Debate Series. Um, I have a lot of experience coaching in particular. I've coached pretty much everyone who does Congress on my team. I've coached some of the best middle schoolers in the state of Florida. And now I get to coach you. Carter? Awesome. Thank you. My name is Carter McDonald. I just graduated from Rock Canyon High School in Colorado. Um, some accomplishments, I've really only been doing circuit Congress for about one year, but despite that, I finaled at Jack Howe, took third at Florida Blue Key, finaled and was seventh at Harvard, finaled and was fifth at TOC, and finaled and was third at Florida Blue Key, where I ran into Nick for the first time. Um, I've had plenty of experience coaching, mainly on my local circuit. I've been the president of my speech and debate team for the past three years, um, and I've had tons of experience with Congress in general. It's been my main event for the past four years, although I've also dabbled in XTEMP. So yeah, super excited to coach you all and hope you find this information helpful. So consistency is one of the most important things in congressional debates. Uh, I know a lot of you are national circuit debaters or aspiring national circuit debaters where there's a lot of really high level competition. Most of you definitely have the basics down pat. I know a lot of you are familiar with Congress and have exper and have you know experienced a lot of success in it. The tricky part is being able to reproduce it every single time you go to a national circuit competition. Uh, and there's a few pillars of performance that we can boil that down to just to make sure you do just as well every single time. So why does consistency matter? You are only as good as your performance in the round you are in. If you think of a good congressional debater, there are some individuals who might pop up in your head. When they go into a round, none of that matters. That perception is irrelevant. Judges rank them based on how well they do in the round. If they do poorly, they're not breaking. They're not champing. If someone who you have never even heard of does better than them, they'll get a better rank. Simple as that. So these are some examples of like why consistency matters. On the right, you see my ranks from Stanford last year. Uh, it could not get more polarizing than two nines, two ones, and a five. That is not consistency. That does not get you first place. I got fourth there. On the other hand, from Digital Speech and Debate Series Finals, number one, uh, those are my ranks on the left. That is consistency. If you have all those ranks, and especially if you avoid getting nines, you can win first place. So there are a couple different things that matter in terms of doing well with an entire panel and doing well round to round. So first of all, let's talk about believability. And Carter, if you have something to add after a slide, feel free to just jump in. Your arguments only count if your judges actually buy them. So we're going to go over some key elements of believability uh, in the slideshow. Believability is a really big deal. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten into a final round and I or someone else just makes an argument that would win the round if it was true, if the judges would believe it, but it isn't, and it's not. And there are a couple really important things you can do to A, pick believable arguments, and B, make them as believable as they are. Yeah, first and foremost on that, we've heard all kinds of arguments, especially when it comes to scenario rounds. But um, specifically when it comes to believability, you got to remember your judge is the average parent. They've been around longer than you. They have common There are some judges with a notable exception for what makes sense. If you come out there and start saying the sky is green and here's why, no one's going to believe it, especially when it comes to arguments about climate or about issues that are a little bit more polarizing. It's important to pick arguments and then to 
back them up with the evidence that we're about to talk about, because without it, it's just your opinion. And while you may think that's valid and you're certainly entitled to your opinion, when you're trying to win around, you got to rely on the experts and what the facts actually say. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it in perspective that you're a teenager, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, full of other kids like you. You get three minutes to boil down the consequences of a complex legislative proposal initiated by the United States government. Keep that in perspective. If you go for wonky arguments that aren't believable, your judges will just forget about them. They'll think, oh, this is nonsense. I'm going to listen to the next speech and see what he or she has to say. There are some benchmarks you can see to like check if your speech is believable just to you know apply all the methods you're going to learn in the slideshow. Do your parents understand your speech? Does your coach? Do your friends? I always read my speeches to my dad, and it's a very frustrating process because often he doesn't understand them. And I've noticed every time I've amended my speech until he does understand them, it's a better speech because in the end, a lot of the time you're giving speeches to fathers and mothers, grandparent judges, coaches, normal people. One big part of that is clarity. And here we're going to get into some techniques that are important to actually achieve that. Once you know what you're doing in terms of basic technique and argumentation impacting, the most important part is actually communicating that effectively to your judges. When I was a beginning like national circuit debater in freshman year, one thing I noticed is I felt really confident in my arguments. I felt that they were well articulated. My judges did not. If you see often in your like feedback on tab room that you made this argument, but your judge thinks you made that argument, then you have an issue with clarity. There's a few things you can do to address that. First of all, you can signpost. This looks like taking some time at the beginning of your speech or before your arguments to say what you're going to do. In this speech, we're going to explain why fracking is bad. You can have really clear transitions. A lot of judges are suckers for structure. They will hold it specifically against you if you do not have a clear structure, even if they understand what you're talking about. Third, you want to signal some important things like weighing or impacting. You want to talk, so why does that matter? Fracking causes climate change. Let's weigh the consequences of banning fracking against the consequences of offshoring. You can be explicit. You can use that jargon to, a, to an extent insofar as it makes your arguments more clear to the judges. And finally, this is one of my favorite things I picked up about halfway through this year. Do a prereq. You want to fit the thesis of your speech into a single sentence after your introduction. You always want to have a sentence in your speech that if you only got to give like one, two, or three sentences of that speech, this is the most important part of it. So here for a fracking bill, for example, this is a negation argument. Banning fracking, like Senator McDonald proposes, would just cause companies to offshore their industry. Companies have a very simple incentive that drives their existence, profit. When our policies make it impossible for companies to do business in the U.S., we drive companies to offshore industries to countries with much weaker environmental regulations. Yeah, I'd like to second that by also saying the human brain is lazy. It looks for what is the easiest route. If you can clearly say, all right, here's my two main points, three main points, whatever you're going to say. All right, let's start by addressing this person's argument. Phrases like that, yes, they take time, but the clarity benefits are immaculate. The amount of times that you hear the phrase highest ground in Nat circuit debates is because these phrases allow the judges to understand what you're trying to do. And while it may seem like a drag, and to an extent it is, it can be annoying to have to sacrifice some time for rhetoric or for more evidence or for impacting, but it doesn't matter. You could have the greatest impact in the world, but if your judge is sitting there going, what has this kid been talking about? It doesn't matter. So make sure you're being clear. Just simply, why does that matter? Let's break it down. Let's analyze it from here. Because your judge is just an adult. They're not a rocket scientist. So since we're talking about consistency, one feature which is going to you know, be common across all of your speeches is the use of evidence. So we're going to talk about how there are a lot of common flaws, misconceptions, mispractices that we can address uh, in terms of finding and using evidence. Judges 
love good evidence, even if they don't write it down. I put some of my feedback here of how like judges flow down specific sources, take note of things you say in your speech. Um, even if they don't do this, they notice if you say like, oh, Fox News reports in October of 2012 that the other side is wrong. In comparison, if you cite the Center, of a, Center for American Progress, June 1st, 2023, judges will naturally be way more inclined to believe any evidence you get from there. So here's an example. Let me know if you can hear it. This is like a really strong example from this uh, speech by Rohit Chawar. You can't hear it? No? Okay, bummer. Well, find the video and uh, look at his speech because he he spends like an entire 10 seconds just spelling out the citation for his sources. He gives the name of the person who did the study. He briefly describes the methodology. He describes the institution. He spells out the, the date, not just in 2023, but June 1st, 2023. All of that stuff amounts to like building up an atmosphere of credibility that makes your judges more inclined to believe everything else you say. Speaking of credibility, let's talk about how you can accomplish that. It is so easy to get lazy with sources. And I was guilty of this for like a very long part of my career. Now I only try to use like really strong sources that no one's going to question like, oh, why did you cite the Center for Budgets? Uh, priorities when their author actually retracted this evidence. That's very embarrassing to have happen in the final rounds, Emory 2023. Not fun. Make sure your evidence is valid, relevant, and credible. Um, some obvious like ways to do that. Established source. Will your judge recognize the name as something credible? Is it recent? You should get wary of going any earlier than 2021. Um, your standards should probably be higher for subjects dealing with like more recent issues, whether it's like Ukraine, for example, you don't want to cite from 2021, it's not going to be relevant anymore. You want to think about the conflict of interest. If you're talking about welfare policy, probably a bad idea to cite the Cato Institute. And is it traceable? Simply by what you say in your speech, can your judge find the source that you mentioned? Do not stoop down to bad sources. It will damage you so much in the long run. It is something that a lot of judges will not include in their feedback because they're more focused on other things, but they definitely do take it into consideration when giving you your speech ranks and your round rankings. A thousand percent. I think a great example of this was at Florida Blue Key where we had the debate on vaccine sites and safe injection sites. Obviously one that right-wing sources have their opinion and left-wing sources have their opinion, but through it all, somebody cited a specific study from Vancouver or whatever, and doing the research on that study, it revealed that not only was it biased, but it also counted like traffic fatalities as overdose deaths. So like when you are tracking your sources down, make sure there aren't any marks against them. Because as Nick said, that's one very uncomfortable to deal with. But also the anxiety that it brings into you trying to give that speech is just horrible, especially if you know about it ahead of time. And like watch watch your bias. I wouldn't say be like super, well, yes, be super wary, but I wouldn't say discount everything that one side says. Just take it with a grain of salt. Keep in mind that if you're talking about immigration and you're quoting Fox News, they do have a very specific opinion. And likewise, if you're going to CNN, you just need to be cognizant of that and not let the idea of, oh, everybody, it's on the internet. It's totally true. That should not be your mind frame. You should be critical of the evidence that you're trying to present. Right. And this is just like a continuation of that. Here you can see some feedback where judges do critique the sources you provide. Uh, so for example, on a minimum wage speech, I cited both the Cato Institute and the Congressional Budget Office. One judge said that, oh, they're philosophically different. It doesn't really make sense if you use the two sources together without analyzing the bias and the respective prejudices of those two sources. Uh, the bottom feedback says that the only evidence you provided was a quote from a U.S. government official whose job is to say factually questionable things to remain politically favorable. This is also something you need to take into perspective because bias can come from places you don't expect it. If the Department of Justice concludes an internal review of the ethics of the Department of Justice and finds everything is great, we're doing a perfect job, 
you know, simply when you say it, you know people are going to question that. You're going to get mentioned in cross X. People are going to bring that up in their speeches and point out how ridiculous it is. And judges will certainly note it down in their ballots. Well, and one thing to note is even when you're using sources like the Huffington Post or any sort of slanted source, you can always check and see what arguments they've hyperlinked, because that may come from a far more credible source. That may come from the Office of Justice. That may come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So that way it's not just Fox News saying it. It's, oh, here's this backed up article that specifically points out the exact thing. So don't necessarily quote that source, but look for where that source got its info. Use Google search operators to find evidence. If you ever can't find what you're looking for, use a minus to strike out certain results. If you're, if you have a debate about the cultivation of, I don't know, rams on farms, and every time you look up rams, you only see like news about football, put dash football, and you'll get more specific results. You can use the or modifier to choose between two specific results to broaden your results. You can use quotations to find a specific phrase. Just a little research tip. Uh, hyperlinks, as Carter mentioned, they are a gold mine. So that's a Brookings Institute like source there. That's what it looks like in the source. And that's what it looks like in my document. When I like take out the excerpts for my research, I don't take out the hyperlinks. Because if I ever look at a piece of evidence more closely and think, oh, this would be really useful for my speech. I want to look into it and not have to pull up the Brookings article and scroll down to where it was originally and then open it. And then it lags for 30 seconds before I can finally find what I'm trying to put into my speech in the middle of a round. Make it easy for yourself. Just copy and paste it along with the hyperlinks. All right. Citing evidence. You can do yourself so many favors just with presenting your evidence in a way that is favorable. You want to include the name of the source and the date. That's like a, a general formula, of course. When you're talking about a date, include at least the month and, a, and the year, preferably include the day. Uh, if it's like a reliable person, you do want to include that specific person and their credentials. So below, for example, I cite the retired four-star Navy Admiral James Tavaritis and what he says in June of 2020. And if it's a reliable organization, even though it's not necessarily that well known, you might want to briefly interject about what they do. Just so your judge is like, I don't know what this is. I don't really trust it. Some other stuff about citing that you can use to make your evidence seem more credible, more trustworthy. If your evidence is super recent, it is a good idea to say like two weeks ago. In Blue Key Finals, there was a piece of evidence I cited, which had been published like the day before the tournament. So I was like, yesterday, the Atlantic wrote that's blah, 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 blah. When judges hear that, their ears will perk up. They think, oh my god, source from yesterday, it must be true. Uh, there are some examples down there of what it looks like when I cite last month, for example. So I cited the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And at the time of me giving that speech, I had collected that evidence. I mean, they, they had collected that data just the prior month. So that's definitely a good way to boost your credibility score. Yeah, Nick's dead on with that evidence specifically about like the recency. Because I remember in Harvard finals, we had some argument about whether or not the truce had been called between Yemenis rebels and the Saudi back coalition. And then somebody brought up some source like five hours ago, there was a bombing that killed 10 people. How is there a peace treaty if there's still ongoing violence? And the person just no idea what to say, because what do you say when your entire argument has just been disproven? So make sure those credibility tags are used when they're relevant, especially if very recent. Um, but yeah, the month and year, that's something that I really didn't start to do regrettably until like my sophomore year. And it just adds so much more um, importance behind what you're saying and so much more believability. As a side note, it's very tempting, especially with a lot of work on your shoulders, as I'm sure you're all ambitious students and probably have pursuits outside of speech and debate to skimp out on your research. That's what I did a lot in my freshman year, especially when, when I went to online tournaments where it was much easier to prep and round. You will burn out of it. You might even regret it a little bit because evidence is king. 
you can prove so many arguments that would otherwise be completely unbelievable without that evidence if you just take a few hours for a bill to you know see what the situation is write down some notes and have evidence come in handy when a specific thing is brought up in rounds it is invaluable it is unbeatable there's nothing you can do against the strong piece of evidence it is the bulwark of your speech okay so this is just like in terms of organizing your evidence when i research i Put everything together like this as you see below that's under my speech when i want to add something i copy and paste it into my speech and i have it there purely organizationally it helps a lot to pre-write your citation phrases like the columbia university of public health writes on july 5th 2021 that yada yada, yada. and you want to hyperlink the sources you want to highlight the relevant parts because sometimes you might have big blocks of text in your research and you want to find the important stuff this is so important if you were in this lab and you still quote evidence stop don't never do it ever 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 again it is so bad for you quotations ruin your speech almost always i think there are like very few circumstances in which they could not take away from your speech. First of all, they sound good in text, but not in voice. Quotations and every and anything that is like written down in a source is meant to sound good in text, not in the flow of a specific, concise three-minute speech dedicated specifically to your arguments. Second, they are unsummarized. They are super non-economical in terms of time. There was a point in my Congress career where like every speech I was going over just because I had so much to say, I stopped quoting. I did not have that issue anymore because I could boil down every piece of evidence purely into the stuff that is actually relevant. And this is like a really easy habit to break. If you just just control F, double quote, delete. Stop it. Um, Carter, do you have any input on this? <laughs> I'm very passionate uh, about paraphrasing. This is something I'm pretty guilty of i've i've been known to quote a few times or to paraphrase a little bit um but especially when it comes to quoting like you got to keep in mind not every word that an article is saying will help you especially when it comes to certain types of judges like a speech judge or whatever or a lay judge plugging my own lecture there but a lay judge isn't going to care what the Washington Post wanted you to read they're going to want you to bring it down to an elementary level in terms of how does it impact people? And the Washington Post explaining on and on about why this is bad for America oftentimes isn't exactly what you want in your speech. So I'd say quotations just need to be very monitored. Drop it into your document. And what I'd personally recommend to all of you is to read over the source like you're giving a speech. See, is it clunky? What would I change in my natural speech cadence? What doesn't fit? And that oftentimes I think will help you paraphrase even more than just outright throwing out quotes. Because for me, quoting was a hard thing to kick. But by doing that, not only is it practice that allows you to get warmed up with your speech, more eloquent in terms of how you're speaking, your cadence down, but also it allows you to tailor it to your needs. So that way you don't feel like you're reading someone else's words up there. 100%. Everything you say when you're up giving a speech should be a product of your own mind. Otherwise, it just won't flow. Uh, always make yourself sound credible. Again, judges love full citations. Always cite your sources properly. If the evidence is really important to your case and you're worried that someone might refute it, you can like very implicitly address those concerns beforehand just by including a lot of information about their name, credentials, and the context of the study. What's up, Carter? Ashwin, to specifically answer your question, when it comes to statistics, obviously you kind of need to keep those. Like you shouldn't mess with them. You can't bump 12% to 25 because you want it to. But think about what's around that block of text. Like when you type it into Google and it comes up as that first result that's highlighted, think about how much of that you actually need, how much of that you should say, and how you can set that up. So yes, obviously getting the stats and linking it to your argument is very important, but it's the what's around the statistics that we're talking about with paraphrasing. Yeah. Continue. Uh, this is an example from state finals. I, instead of just saying like a study by the University of Minnesota from March of 2022, I cite specifically the people who did it and mention that they're the authors. Just a little bit, 
you know, to show that I care about the source of my evidence, which is like the craking, the the the, the fulcrum of my speech. Uh, a little trick here. If you're citing a source which may be biased simply because of the organization it's in, but you know that the arguments or the evidence itself is true and valid, look at the author, see if they have any other affiliations. Because if you want to say, oh, Don Smithson, author for the Cato Institute, like judges might get a very negative connotation from that. But if it's just like straight up legit statistical analysis, and the guy happens to be the director of some other think tank, you can say Don Smithson, director of some other think tank, found on June 5th, 2021. That well, way also, you don't deal with the connotation. To back up off that, especially when it comes to war or anything, when you're dealing with international diplomacy, quoting the office is also a huge deal. Nick brought up the example of the four-star Air Force general, but think about in like a situation like Taiwan or Ukraine. Their opinion is going to matter a lot more than whatever CNN said because they're the experts. They're the ones that are actively dealing with this conflict. So a great way to provide more credibility and also to land yourself some bonus points with judges is to mention like four-star general, exactly like Nick said. And that allows you to get into more of the author rather than just where the piece came from. I'll give y'all like 20 seconds to pull up a notebook or or a note stock because this is the most important part of the slideshow. These are these are some really essential things a lot of people just don't do and they really should do because they're very good. Okay. Using evidence strategically and combining it with really solid warranting is what separates good arguers from great arguers. So first of all, does your evidence actually actually accomplish something? Think of it this way. If you use your evidence to just introduce a claim, you don't need the evidence. That's really just your own thinking, your own position. If your evidence tries to prove a point that is intuitively true on its own, you don't need to include the source. That's just a waste of time. Ask yourself, if you remove the citation from that part of your speech, does it fundamentally make your argument less important less valid or less credible? If the answer is no, don't include it. There's an example there. For, for instance, the Environmental Protection Agency wrote in 2016 that, quote, in 2010 and 2012, high nighttime temperatures affected corn yields across the US corn belt. Okay, affected how? No quantification there. 2016, super late. It's quoted, disgusting. Delete it. Delete it and find something better. All right. Second, do you need a source to say what you are saying? Often debaters prefer a preface, obvious facts, examples, or truism with a citation. The Center for American Progress writes in June of 2022 that American fiscal policy ought to be res responsible and sustainable. Well, gee, thanks, Center for American Progress. Now we really know how to fix this issue. No, just say American fiscal policy ought to be responsible and sustainable. Ask yourself. If you take out the citation, does the statement become uncredible? I'd like to find somebody trying to argue against that idea that American fiscal policy should be responsible and sustainable. There'd be an interesting uh, refutation argument there. Yeah, that's that's actually a good point. Evidence is so strong because it proves things that might otherwise be contentious if you just say them on their own. If it is accepted as fact by anyone who hears it just when you say it, you don't need the source. It's not doing anything. And finally, and this is the most important thing, this, I, I'm, I'm willing to like attribute so much of my success specifically to the strategy. Do you explain the cause? Do you explain why the evidence is valid? Way too often, debaters don't explain the causal link between the bill, their warrant, and the impact. Evidence can be so useful for illustrating that entire process. The New York Times writes on July 28th, 2021, that Nick is 78% a dummy head. That is a unwarranted statistic and very mean. But if you explain that the New York Times writes on July 28th, 2021, that Nick is 78% a dummy head because he can't die, tie his shoes, there is some warranting there. You might also want to explain the methodology. How did they reach the number 78%? Not exactly sure. I don't appreciate the New York Times. Horrible newspaper. Let's move on. According to, to NOAA's National Ocean Service last month, half of Miami is projected to become uninhabitable by the end of the century. Okay. 
It's horrible. But what does that have to do with the bill? According to NOAA's National Ocean Service last month, half of Miami is projected to become uninhabitable by the end of the century because sea levels will rise by about 1.5 meters. Now you get closer to what the bill in question might do. If it's a carbon tax, is it going to reduce the rise of sea levels? Is it going to build sea walls to make Miami more resistant to that? You get closer to actually finding the solution simply by including that phrase at the end of your evidence. It does so much work for you. So ask yourself, does my evidence explain why or how something is true instead of just saying it's true? Look at any of your old speeches. I'm sure you will find like unwarranted, uncontextualized empirics. You can fix them just by appending a phrase explaining why those empirics are true, how they have been reached. Your evidence should be believable, not just because it has a credible sounding citation next to it, but because it makes sense on an intuitive level. Okay, let's talk about ethos and personal credibility. This is a very important part of Congress. And I think people have like the wrong perception of how clout and personal confidence and round presence plays into how you and your arguments are perceived and around. So let me put it this way. Who do you trust more? 12th grader Rohit Jawar goes up there, full beard, right? Six foot two, I don't know how tall he is. Let's say six foot two, he seems like a tall guy. Dressed up in his black suit, dark color tie, serious, grim expression. On the other hand, Look at cute little 8th grader Nick Ostheimer on the side at Middle School TOC 2021. Look at his little bow tie. Look at his curly hair. Look at, look at his babyish expression. Even if both of us deliver the most banger speech you have ever heard, we might both rank well, but Rohit will rank over me. You know why? Because he looks like an adult. If he walks up to the street and says, hey, there's like a fire on the other side of the town. You should run away you will believe Rohit. If 8th grade Nick Ostheimer walks up to you and says the same thing, you'll say, scram, kid. I'm not trying to get pranked. That's the difference. That's the difference. And you have to acknowledge that. And to some extent, there's nothing you can do about it because you look the way you look. But you can influence it. And it's good to just be conscious of that like difference in, in personal credibility and ethos. For example, all judges have implicit or explicit bias. A lot of judges will be like, will, will like purposefully say, I favor the best legislator. I favor involvement in the round. Uh, that means that they will like purposefully give better ranks to people who exhibit perceptual dominance and a lot of round presence. Otherwise, any judges who say they don't care, yeah, well, it'll still affect their ranks. So how can you improve that? Confidence? You all probably have pretty good confidence when it comes to speaking. Authenticity and conviction. We have a slide on that. We'll get to it later. Involvement and engagement in the rounds. It's very important just to not be like forgotten as a competitor. And finally, dress and appearance. Depressing, but true. Yeah, the whole point on confidence is such a huge step in the right direction because I've noticed this less in Congress, but more in extemp, but the lesson does transfer. When you believe what you're saying, as our lecturer Grant Davis pointed out, when you really say it with your chest, when you're confident in what you're about to say, it's really difficult for people to lodge a good argument against you. Another great example of this is what we saw in Blue Key. We had the Chess Act, which had a bunch of different provisions on how to create, quote, a habitually equal sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I'm not an expert in sub-Saharan Africa, never claimed to be, probably never will be, but it's the fact that I was able to, one, get the research. The research does give you that sort of confidence because you're like, okay, it's not just me. There is reason to believe this. There's valid arguments for it. But when you employ those in terms of how you speak, when it's not just complete rambling, when it's structured, when you're taking people point by point and you're breaking things down for the judges, it really makes you seem like you're in charge. And whether or not judges like to admit it or not, whoever's in charge is going to be the one that's going to get the one. So make sure that you're being confident. The involvement in the round just shows that you care. Yes, you're confident. Yes, you know what you're doing. 
but it doesn't mean that you're just there to pick up an award. You care about the round and you're trying to stay engaged. And dress and appearance, just shave. The number one thing that's annoying is when people don't do that. I've been guilty of that myself. And it's a tough day in the office when you forget to do that. But seriously, if somebody comes across with unkempt hair, looking like they slept on a mattress on the side of the road last night versus somebody who's well-maintained, ready to speak, completely seems to be in control of their own person, a judge is going to naturally be more inclined to listen. Yeah, unless you can grow a Rohit Jawar beard, you should probably keep it clean shaven. Yeah. To be honest. Okay. So let's talk about engagement. This is this is simple enough, honestly. Be involved. Make your voice heard. That doesn't even have to be just like pre and post round politics. You don't have to be in with all the cool kids, with all the great debaters to be like a relevant force in the rounds. You don't have to be involved in, in docket politics to be important. There are so many things you can do to fade it. So like avoid fading into the background as a speaker and as a personality in the round. It helps to show up early and leave late. If no one is talking, start conversation. I've been in like dead silent, awkward prelim rounds at like two or three Natsar competitions. And you just say, so uh, where's everyone from? And then you won't get that room full of debaters to shut up for the next 20 minutes. You started that. That makes an impact, like psychologically on the judges, to know that you started a bunch of social engagement in the room. You want to name drop and clash, obviously, it shows engagement. You want to ask as many questions as possible. You want to be up at the very front of the uh, recency and precedence chart. And if you can, you want to be funny, both inside and outside of your speeches. Uh, funny man Nick Ostheimer doesn't actually do a lot of jokes and speeches, but I like to joke around like before rounds because it feels more natural there and it helps. I mean, I, I, I like to think it helps people get over their nerves and be a bit more personable with everyone in the chamber. So these are just like a bunch of passive, small incremental factors that lead up to engagement, which is a big factor in how judges evaluate you. One note on questioning. While it's tempting to just ask a question at every available opportunity, and you should, make sure you're asking good questions. Like if you're just saying something to say it or if never ask a friendly question, I don't know if that's in that circuit thing, but it happens on my local circuit a lot. Never, ever, ever ask a friendly question. You might as well just be handing the one or whatever rank you want to somebody else. Effectively, questions are there for you to trap somebody into some logical pit or for you to point out a flaw in the argument that they cannot recover from in that 30 seconds. So specifically make sure that you have yourself laid out. One of the best examples that I ever saw of this was, I think it was in Harvard semis or something. Somebody was talking about whether or not a bill was going to do enough. And somebody made the analogy, hello, Senator. I have a question for you. If you were really hungry and I gave you the choice between three food options, gas station curry, my mom's curry, or no curry, which one would you pick? And they, of course, said the someone's mom's curry because that probably has the better chance of being the best. That's a valid point. But the gas station curry is still better for you in the long run than no curry at all because you won't be as hungry. So the idea was trap somebody with something that's memorable. The judge is going to remember the guy who asked somebody about curry. But the fact that it related back and he said, then why shouldn't we pass this bill, provide funding so that way we can have our gas station curry equivalent? That sounds bad, but you get the idea, right? It's breaking something down to logical terms that are memorable and still proving your point. Your questions should have purpose. Don't just ask them because you think you need to. Yeah, my personal favorite method of engagement is rhetorical clash. If someone questions me like that about curry. I mean, I'll take a speech explaining why you should not eat the gas station curry and why nothing is better. You want to work with the metaphor. And honestly, I think the logic is on my side here. I'm not going to eat gas station curry one way or another. Anyways, <laughs> let's 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 move on. Uh, authenticity and conviction is very important. Judges can tell if you don't care. Like it's it's really annoying for them to wake up 6 a.m. Kentucky, Phoenix, wherever it is they are. And you go up there and you're like, Guys, right, we should ban fracking. Fracking is bad. Fracking causes climate change. The New York Times writes on June 1st, 2021, that fracking resulted in 16 million tons of carbon emissions. 
Therefore, we should ban fracking. No, don't do that. Memorize your intro and conclusion no matter what. Uh, that's feedback from Kendall Lindsay was from a very embarrassing round. It was blue key round robin finals. And I went up there with an iPad in front of like a bunch of old school Congress competitors. And I read my intros off my iPad. God. It was horrible. Don't, don't do that. Memorize your intros and conclusions and preferably don't speak off of an iPad. Um, it helps to speak on the side that you personally agree with because you have a lot more emotional and rhetorical range when you have your own personal justifications for why you believe in a position. Of course, that's not a luxury you always have. You want emotional emphasis on impacts. Everyone knows this. Rhetoric often comes after impacts because that's where it sinks in deepest, and you want to avoid jargon. It can seem really cold and impersonal when you describe a very emotionally and rhetorically touching situation using all of this jargon. Let's link turn this argument about 7,000 Yemeni children being killed by Saudi Arabian bombing. You're a monster. Jeez, use some like considerate language instead of debate jargon. I This was an issue, especially when I judged um, this year's middle school TOC. I, I definitely heard the line like, oh, I don't buy your solvency about how this bill is going to get like 2,000 homeless people out of the streets. Jesus. Okay. Speak, speak with some considerate language. Be down to earth. Uh, oh, that's the end of the slideshow. You guys have any questions? About consistency. Not all at once. Bueller. Bueller. Well, guess it was a good slideshow. Uh, just one final note for the chamber. Remember, this is something that I brutally got reminded of in my feedback from the TOC parliamentarian. Uh, you are supposed to be a real congressman. One, brief note, don't reference that you're a debater. Don't do it. It'll drop you to 16th. Just, it, it, just save yourself the headache. Don't do it. But more importantly... The reason why you need to consider yourself as a real legislator is you need to be focusing on why the bills have impact. That will give you all of these keys, all of this consistency that we just talked about. If you actually consider the bill in terms of what it does for your low income constituents, what it does for people in your region, what it does to people across the United States, don't, especially when it comes to economic bills, it's really easy to go, my GDP growth is bigger than your GDP growth and you need to vote on my side. No, put that in context. One, you sound out of touch and like Marie Antoinette with the let them eat cake when you start talking about purely economic statistics with no grounding. But also just think about it from a judge perspective. If you have the exact same evidence as somebody else about GDP, or if you're trying to make the same argument, then extend it. Be like, great, GDP increases. Let's see what happens when we do that. Great. The average earnings of an an or of a household per capita go up. What does that translate into? Less food insecurity, less problems when it comes to accessing education, greater social mobility. These are tangible things that people can see and value. Make sure if you want to sound confident that you're making arguments that actually have weight. Yes, it's important to consider the economic ramifications of a carbon tax, but it's just as important to consider what those economic ramifications do to your average constituent. That'll help you sound way more empathetic. That'll help you sound way more connected to the round. And more importantly, way more confident because you have the most important impacts when you're the one talking about what actually happens. Facts. Okay. In the last however many minutes we have, let's hear a speech. Anyone want to volunteer to give a speech, NSDA or not, and we'll check it against the rubric and we can like do group reflection. Any takers, we'll get through like one. Okay. I'll do a really old bad speech and you can do it for me.
Let's see. Here, Nick, if you want me to do what I can as well. No, it's good. This is from Blue Key freshman year. I think this is my second ever NatSerk competition. Okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Senator Nicholas Ostheimer. I'm a freshman from FAU High School. Judges and PO, please let me know if you're not ready. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and get started. America is falling behind. Labor shortages and stagnating commerce make it evident that we need to consolidate global trade. China's unethical practices and rampant growth threaten fair trade on a global scale, demanding international cooperation. The obvious solution is to rejoin the TPP, a free trade agreement between 12 Pacific countries intended to corner China's unscrupulous markets and promote trade. First, we have to address the, the immense economic benefits of this bill. The TPP would have created a fully integrated economic bloc of 12 Pacific countries. The CFR wrote last month that, quote, such a deal would have expanded U.S. trade and investment abroad, spurred economic growth, lowered consumer prices, and created new jobs. In 2012, we engaged in $1.8 trillion worth of trade with countries that would have been in the TPP. Economists at the CSIS estimate that passing this bill would reduce tariffs between us and those countries by up to 98%. In effect, we increase prosperity for the average working person and help break small businesses into global supply chains. The Office of the U.S. Trade Representative reports that the TPP would bring $77 billion in income to American workers. The TPP requires nations to give particularly favorable terms and benefits to small entrepreneurs and businesses to engage in worldwide trade. The TPP would open up trade across the Pacific, creating a unified pact of countries dedicated to mutual growth, fair trade, and prosperity. Vote with me on the affirmation. Moving on, we have to recognize that this bill defines our foreign policy regarding China. While we're in the TPP, we negotiate the terms for other countries to enter. That means we can either let China in and make them accept rigorous new standards for free trade and worker rights, or we lock them out, take a massive advantage, and compete against them on their home turf. First, the threat to China if they refuse to join the TPP is a loss of trade with the U.S. and other TPP members. The University of Chicago writes in 2020 that the TPP could divert trade away from China and direct trade toward other countries, such as Australia, that enjoy more friendly relations with the U.S. and enforce higher labor standards. Second, Gary Hoofbauer, Assistant Secretary for International Trade and Investment Policy at the U.S. Treasury, writes, quote, China would have to embrace unprecedented domestic reforms to meet disciplines on state-owned enterprises, data flows and localization restrictions, labor obligations and su subsidies. If we affirm, we make China accept these terms if they want to stay relevant in global trade. But if we don't affirm, none of that happens, and we allow China to write the rules of trade for the 21st century. Every day we're not in, China has better chances of being in. Now, I've established how joining the TPP would have fantastic financial benefits for the U.S. Well, consider that if we don't join, China will, and they'll reap the rewards of this agreement instead of us. Not only that, but they will shape the landscape of global trade for decades to come. To bring about international prosperity and tame China's business practices, we must affirm this bill. I now stand ready for any and all cross-examination. Ending with the cross-ex line goes hard, dude. I miss doing that. <laughs> I yield the rest of my time for questioning. Overall, all right, that was feedback. Good. That was not as bad as I thought that was going to be, or the way you made it sound. You made it sound like your freshman prep was horrific. That was not that bad. There were some there were some quoted sources. The CFR wrote last month that that one hit a little bit. And then the China one. Yeah, but overall, oh yeah, just the and created new jobs. How many? Could have been one, two, actually, because it needs to be multiple. But yeah, we have plural. no idea. <laughs> overall, that was pretty good. I was I was I was impressed. Come on, guys, jump in because this th this is my freshman year, and I know quite a lot of you are freshmen. So, like, if you have, if you see similarities between your own prep and this, let's like think about the rubric and see what we can do differently. Um, I noticed like a difference between my prep and yours is that you definitely use more evidence than me. Like, if right, if like most of your bullet points are like statistics or like pieces 
of evidence. Like, I feel like I usually don't use as much. Um, Like, yeah, I, I definitely stopped using as much later on. Now my average per speech is more like two or three. This one had five, but yeah, I see what you mean. Anything Guys, noticed? this is your chance to rip into me. Let me, Good let me bad. have it. I thought it was good signposting and uh, contention too. So yeah, I think that's an upside. Yeah. Um, the CFR did it not have that link to the warrant? Yes, it does. It does not explain why it happens. It's not yeah. causal. Okay, that's really all I got. Who knows what the CFR is? Council on Foreign Relations. If a 40-year-old parent judge hears CFR, what are they going to think it means? Same with the TPP. Yeah. Trans-Pacific Partnership, more like. Yeah. Not once do I actually say Trans-Pacific Partnership in this entire speech. Big clarity issue. This could just be a side note, but there was like some bold assumptions down there in the in the China point on what we would or would not be able to do. Like, how are you going to make China accept terms if they want to remain that like I there's so many holes in that logic due to China's willingness to break any trade agreement ever in the history of its you know time. So it really doesn't make sense for that to logically just somehow work now. True. Okay, I'm going to pick you guys to critique something about my speech. Vince, what sucks about this? Come on. Uh, I don't know. First thing that just jumped out of my mind was like structure. <laughs> okay, what about structure? Uh, well, it's like following the LD method, like intention one and two. It's not like that well streamlined like first you say the benefit and then you say that like okay there's some good coming out but then like if we don't do it there's bad that comes out of it kind of like it's not like it's just something structured that isn't that like too streamlined if you know what i mean yeah it's like a mid two point speech yeah i agree uh athena what sucks We can't hear you. On your speeches, but um, I think there's not like a lot of like, like you have good evidence and you mentioned like evidence, warrants, claims, whatever impacts, but like you don't have anything that makes it like memorable in the round, I guess. Yeah, that's actually a really good thing to point out. This speech is b -b 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 boring. This sucks. There's nothing fun about this. I mean, like, it is, I know like, like a lot of these are like serious trade. topics. Yeah, there's a lot of like serious topics, but like you didn't throw any like jokes or like very like impactful vocabulary words, whatever in there. Yeah, uh, the fact that the topic is serious is a very good reason to actually try to lighten it up. For example, in the seventies, a wise group of philosophers beep makers and rappers discovered an immutable truth about our society. Cream. Cash rules everything around me. In that respect, America is falling behind. And then we jump into the rest of it, and it's already so much better. Because it's like Wu-Tang Clan. Everyone loves that. Okay, anything else? Gavin? Uh, yeah. Um, this, like, third bullet point, like, you don't cite, like, the time, like, when the, the office of the United States, but there's no, like, date of when it was cited. Yep. Uh, Karina, what sucks about this speech? Um, do you have any impact, like any clear impact? Because like you obviously give your reasons and all that, but then it's like, why should I care? Like this isn't about 
like, you know, s like you have to, yeah. It's, exactly. I feel like if you could relate it back to the U.S. and like what we get from passing or not passing or, um, yeah, why does it matter? Just humanizing it. And I think it goes back to the memorable thing because like everyone in Congress is like, everyone goes up with their like evidence and their contentions and oftentimes they're rather similar it's more just like impacts that make you stand out so i feel like if i heard this as a judge like i probably wouldn't even like look at it twice like i would forget it completely Yep. Uh, about the impact specifically, neither contention did well on this. The first one is strictly economical. I don't humanize it one bit, which is very bad. Uh, the second part, this is a very common mistake, actually, on anything relating to China. You cannot take it for granted that China sucks. A lot of judges will like share that conception of China, but one thing you can do in almost any round is be the person to actually explain why China's economic growth or diplomatic dominance is so detrimental to the world or to the United States or whatever. Kevin, what sucks about this speech? It's a really big thing. It's just, it almost seems more of a stamp radio style speech, not like congressional. Because it's Kevin, just... sorry to interrupt you, but it sounds like you're... It, this, this probably isn't the case, but it sounds like you're very far from your computer. You might want to check your mic. Is this better? Yes, that's good. Okay, yes, definitely. So to me, this seems a lot more kind of almost an extemporaneous style speech rather than congressional, just since it doesn't have the big, how is it helping our constituents in a sense, but more of the just, here's the big picture, in my opinion. Yeah, I see what you mean. True. All right. Well, since we're still recording, I'm going to have to conclude this in appropriate fashion. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to this fantastic slideshow made by Equality and Forensics. Uh, Equality and Forensics is dedicated to making high school speech and debate more accessible through 100% free online resources, including the camp at which this was recorded. Uh, so thank you all for listening. I hope you had a good time in this lesson and this lecture. Bye. Like and subscribe. Okay. Uh, what are we doing now? Hell notification. <laughs> Ow. What is on the schedule? It is oh, our wait, break least... time. Oh, this is the break? Mm-hmm. And then it's and back at 3.30. Oh, fun. Okay. Wait, that's the, isn't that the mock round of the NSDA? Which yep. bill is it again? The, is it universal? Is it... Yep. What do you wait? What like what's like? What are you trying to do for the mock round? Like like is it like a straight up just mock round? Yep. Oh, okay. I don't know if there's enough people for me to practice my speech because I'm planning on doing a half ref. So. There might be. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Hey, no.